Well, good evening. Whoa, is that too loud? No. Who knew? There, there are official people here in charge of volume. <laughs> so, um, there he is. There's the volume. And there's another person in charge of quality. So we have both things covered. <laughs> OK, then. My name is Jonathan Zittrin. And uh, I am so pleased to be in conversation tonight with Bruce Schneier. Bruce is a kind of a really good person to introduce in the sense that He's extremely well known, but not for trite reasons. It's actually hard to put a bumper sticker on Bruce and not simply because he's security conscious. I think the closest thing would be uh, he's extremely well known for his attitudes and uh, common sense around TSA. And I believe you actually coined the phrase Secur security theater. Security theater is mine. And that's a great phrase. And you can't help but enjoy every episode of security theater as you encounter <laughs> it now on uh, the way. And uh, it's also been really interesting to see Bruce's evolution from somebody writing a canonical text in applied cryptography, kind of has the technical chops, then really thinking more systemically, including human factors, about security. And again, in his explanations being lucid, but not reducing in ways that immediately make good guys and bad guys and sort of simplistic uh, slogans. And yet still, again, popular enough that I believe you are an internet meme, are you not? Oddly enough, yes. There is an internet meme about You look Bruce up Bruce Schneier facts. I have nothing to do with them. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but just not now. <laughs> Well, it's too late. Um, don't you guys put these rooms in Faraday cages? I don't. That would be an MIT yeah. thing to do, oh, okay. and yet not, because <laughs> then they would hack the Faraday cage. But um, we just rely on law to keep people honest, and it doesn't work. Um, so that's a deeper problem than the ones we're going probably to talk about uh, tonight. The last time Bruce and I shared a stage, I believe it was 2010, mm -hmm. and it was for the Intelligence Squared debate, resolved the cyber war threat has been greatly exaggerated. Grossly exaggerated. Grossly it, exaggerated. It, I mean, I, it was kind of interesting. It was, it was myself and Mark Rottenberg on one side. We were the sides of, yes, it's grossly exaggerated. On the other side was Mike McConnell, used to run the NSA, now a big exec at Booz Allen Hamilton, one of the people who grossly exaggerate cyber war for a living, and you. It seems only fitting to right. be on that side of the debate. And I actually thought it pretty easy. I would present a list of gross exaggerations, we'd all vote, and then we'd go home. Uh, it was more complicated, and um, I actually lost that debate. It really surprised me. But at the end of the hour and a half or something, more, and the, the vote was they polled the audience in the beginning and polled the audience at the end. So you could think about how to game the system. Let's assume people didn't. Uh, but more, more people are convinced that cyber was a real threat than was grossly exaggerated. And it really was thinking about that loss that really got me to understand the cyber war debate, you know, why we lost. And a lot of it was definitional. We spent most of the time arguing on the definition of cyber war. And I think that is, in a lot of ways, the policy problem today. That we don't know when cyber war starts, when it ends, what it looks like when it's going on. And it's not just you know, the debaters or, 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 or uh, researchers. It's, you know, it's policy people. Don't, ha don't have a good definitions. So it's real hard to discuss whether the threat is exaggerated unless you know what the is is. And I'm going to go on a little bit. This is, I mean, it used to be, in the real world, you would judge, you would judge the threat by the weaponry. Right? When you saw a tank driving at you, you knew it was war because only governments could afford tanks. Right, the problem in cyberspace is everyone's using the same weaponry. Right? Everyone's using DDoS attacks. Everyone's using exploits. Everyone's using exfiltration. They're all doing the same thing. You can't look at the weaponry. You can't look at the tactics and figure out who you're fighting. And this is a problem, right? Because when, when you're being attacked in cyberspace, you're being attacked in general. You, there are a lot of people you can call. Right? You can call the police. You can call the military. You can call Homeland Security. You can call your lawyers. I guess we're here. 
<laughs> right? and, and the regime in which your defense operates depends on exactly two things, who's attacking you and why. And when you're attacked in cyberspace, the exact two things you don't know are who's attacking you and why. So you were seeing the military use a very expansive definition because they want to you know, capture the whole, you know, the whole gamut of the attacks, where I argue very strongly for a much narrower definition. And that's, that is why I lost that debate. You've never heard that. Um, you well, think it's because you debated better than I did, no, but in fact you didn't. I was, ha -ha. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say you lost because we hacked the vote, <laughs> thereby proving our side. Um, and, uh, well, more of McConnell's friends were in the audience. Yes. And, right, and, and if, of course, if they voted no to start, they, they, but I assume they played fair. <laughs> uh, indeed. <laughs> well, this isn't a debate in the sense that we often, I think, share more views than we disagree upon. And it's also not a debate in the sense that I think we're wanting the structure of this conversation and the one that we'll put out to the entire room uh, before too long as thinking aloud more than advancing some particular view and asking people to hammer upon it. This really is, especially given the collective brain trust I already see in this room, this is like a group study uh, <laughs> exercise more than it is a delivery of an academic paper or a thesis that we're then supposed to uh, beat up upon. Um, by way of framing, though, I think it is interesting first, just from the remarks as you were getting into substance, to already hear you using words like weapon, which already seems to me to be conceding a big part of the frame of the debate, something that you see the likes of Anonymous, I think, ironically, deploying when they talk about the low orbit ion cannon, <laughs> which is, I think, uh, life yeah. imitating art, imitating art, imitating life, because the low orbit ion cannon is itself not a real cannon. Um, but uh, I, I think also, it's, I hope we'll get a chance to talk about what I perceive at least as a trajectory in your own thinking from the beyond fear phase, which captured a lot of your thinking about, look, it's complicated, it's not like there aren't real threats, but we're often focused on exactly the wrong stuff to our detriment, hence let's get beyond fear, to what I think is shaping up to be maybe your next book, which you haven't named it yet, but as best I can tell, the title might be Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid. <laughs> and it's about asymmetric threats very generally from technology, not even limited to cyber. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm characterizing this because he'll feel free to correct my characterization in a moment. But I know you have a lot of worries about the asymmetries between offense and defense and the prospect that as time goes on, our normal ways of handling things, and including normal is how reasonable, technically oriented people would handle them, may fall short and thereby leave us with a real dilemma about how to secure ourselves. That's at least, I think, right. where you're at on the current puzzle. That's so we can start there and work back or start at the beginning and work forward. Well, that's a piece of it. And it is a small piece, but it's something I've been wondering about for a while. And I wrote it down. And uh, you know, some of the comments I got was, wow, you must have had a really bad day. I mean, very generally, very generally, we accept a certain amount of, of bad action in society. Right? The, right, the price of freedom is the possibility of crime. We recognize that, that in order to be a free society, we deliberately limit what the police can do. We do a bunch of things to make crime possible. And there's a crime rate that we accept. Right? The murder rate is not zero, and we wouldn't want it to be zero. There's a whole lot of reasons why that would be bad. And, and we have some natural. We might want it to be zero, but we realize that what it would take to make it so would we make want us the, not the society we, we want to we be. We want the ill effects, right? Yeah. We, we, be too many false or false arrests. I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons why you wouldn't want that. So, yeah. we, and if you think about this, the amount of damage a bad actor can do is a, vaguely a function of technology. I mean, that uh, terrorists can kill X people as a function of technology: one, ten, a hundred, a thousand, as their weaponry gets better. Uh, a bank robber can can steal more money or steal more accounts. As the amount of damage an individual bad actor can do increases, the fewer bad actors we're willing to tolerate, right? If, if, assuming that effect is constant. I mean, we want a murder rate of x. 
if the murderers murder 10 times as many people as before, then we need one tenth of them to keep that number. I mean, this is very hand wavy and vague. <laughs> which is and this just in, Bruce will never be running for elective office ever. <laughs> oh, God, no. And in of fact, appointed office is now seriously in question. <laughs> Whole lot of reasons for that. So as It'll be legalized soon. As the amount of <laughs> as the amount of damage increases, the number of bad actors we're willing to tolerate decreases. And in theory, you can imagine it get to the point where even one is bad. Even one is too much. Right? This is the weapons of mass destruction debate. Right? The terrorists can do so much frickin' damage that we must rewrite ev all of our laws to make sure we catch them before they do their bad thing. Right? No more after the fact detection response that works for murder and a lot of other crimes. I mean, this must be predictive policing. This must be arresting people on conspiracy. I mean, all of those reasons why you have these very invasive uh, investigative tools. Which is to say what used to be a spectrum on a dial of enforcement to try to scale to the nature of the problem becomes a binary choice between doom from terrorist or doom from police state. Kind of. You know, so my, my worry is now. I'm doing my best on the bumper sticker. No, that's here. good. <laughs> and, and, and eventually I'll do a bumper sticker because I like them too. Eventually you get to the point where technology becomes so great and I'm wondering this is not now a general rule of civilization we could apply around, the, apply around the galaxy. If there comes a point in any species' technological advancement where the amount of damage one lone actor can do is so devastating that it de destroys society. <coughs> now, if that's the case, and I'm postulating that destroying is easier than preventing destruction, there will be a window in technological advancement where one lone actor or a group of lone actors can destroy society. So now, what is the chance that society can get beyond that? I'm not sure I'm optimistic about the chances. Right? You know, it, it, it's, you know, we, we tend to run a pretty wide tail bell curve around our species. So that's, in general, the worry. Now, what does that mean? I'm not sure. Is it true? I mean, a lot of things I wrote this to, to see if people can refute that well. Right? Maybe, and, and argue, in the last book, I spent a whole chapter arguing on, the, on this notion that uh, the attackers have an inherent advantage because they're, they're a first mover. They're a first mover and they can react quicker. Oh, uh, what's an example? Uh, someone invents the motor car, and the police say, what a great idea, and they have a, a committee to study the use of a car, they produce an RFP, they get bids, they buy a car, they have a training program, they figure out how to use it. Meanwhile, the bank robber says, oh, look, new getaway vehicle. Right? The, the, and we saw this on the internet. Right? You know, as soon as the internet appears, you suddenly have this new breed of cyber criminal who like, emerges organically and figures out how to commit crime on the internet. Meanwhile, the police, who have been trained on Agatha Christie novels, it took them, what, 10 years to figure out how to defend. And I'll argue, in general, there will be this temporal gap as society increases, I mean, as technology increases, where the, the bad actors, the lone actors, the fringe actors are more agile. It is interesting, though. Your story is basically good cops and bad robbers are on a similar baseline, and then the robbers adopt enabling technology sooner. It may also be a little bit the good cops or just cops are right. very well resourced, use that to have an advantage that they might not have in sheer numbers, but use the technology to leverage it. I can listen in on a conversation right. that you can't, and then the technology has a democratizing effect levels the playing field, but makes it so that the cops no longer have the multiplier they were relying I guess either way, it's yeah, the same I mean, outcome. I don't know. I mean, I, I, mean, I have I mean, other thoughts where we're seeing power use technologies to effects that we didn't imagine before. And there are exceptions to this. Uh, fingerprint technology is, a, is, a, is an easy exception. Right? This is a technology that benefited the police and didn't benefit the criminals at all. Or really, the, the thing that advanced policing 
most probably in the last thousand years is the invention of the radio. That, it truly, that fundamentally changed the way police work works. Because no longer was a policeman a lone actor in the community. He was able to radio for backup, and that just changed everything. Uh, right, you can argue that, and I think this is also true, while the, the, the fringe actors are more nimble, the, uh, the state actors, the powerful actors, have, have a greater multiplier. Right, can make use of technology not faster, but once they figure it out, to greater effect. Right, so, and we're seeing that now in the, the government of, of Syria using Facebook to, to spy on people, or you know, using internet, internet technologies for surveillance, whereas five years ago, the only people using them effectively were the dissidents. And now it's not clear where the new balance is. Well, so I want to just uh, bookmark a little bit as we go, because we can put a few ideas on the table and then have a larger conversation. So one idea on the table is what I kind of called be very afraid. <laughs> Another way of describing it is uh, asymmetry between offense and defense. And I'm an inherent optimist, so it's weird to sort of have this dystopian essay under my belt. Well, especially because it's not just dystopian, it runs in a very different flow from a lot of your other work, mm -hmm. such as your work on digital feudalism. There's a loaded term for you. Um, in which you worry a lot about centralization of certain technological functionalities, uh, either with private actors, the Googles and Apples or whoever of the world, or public authorities, the Syrias of right. the world. And that's the kind of thing for which it's exactly those folks that would want to do that and encourage that centralization that would benefit from fanning the fears of the first topic. You know, if you want right. to be protected from these asymmetries, come shelter your website under Amazon Web Services, come do your email through <coughs> Gmail, and let us filter your spam and malware. And right. I, by the way, I think Bruce and I may be the only people in the room still using Eudora. <laughs> Any other Eudora users? I saw. Here? I saw a Pine. Pine. Yeah, I met a Pine user. It wasn't a, my email client is older than yours <laughs> challenge. I knew there'd be Pine users. I was just, there's that one moment in history that we both tend to. It's, it's going to be sad when we have to give up Eudora because nothing else yeah. is like it. I keep clicking on as many banner ads as possible <laughs> just to keep it afloat. But uh, anyway, it, it, so the, like a second cluster of thinking that you have uh, recently is around mm -hmm. this sort of digital fuse. And I want to just give you a little space to kind of map that out and say welcome to the club of people worrying about this. Actually, to me, this, this does echo the stuff that, that, was, that was in your book, which I actually had to relook at after forgetting it and re-remembering it. <laughs> that's, I, a, that's a blurb worth putting on the back. <laughs> <laughs> the book's so nice, I read it twice after I forgot it the first time. It's actually not that bad. So, <laughs> <laughs> the book or the blurb? The, the blurb. The okay, blurb. good. I've been thinking a lot about, about power, I mean, power and, and power asymmetry. And I see increasingly we're, we're living in a computing world that I liken to feudalism. Right? The idea being if you pledge your allegiance to uh, Apple and give them your email and your calendar and your address book and your photographs, your life is easy. Right? And they, in turn, I guess they promise to protect you. Right? You can pledge your allegiance to Google. In s a lot of us pledge some of our allegiance to Facebook, to Amazon. I mean, all of these companies that are increasingly uh, controlling our data right, as we move them onto these platforms and controlling our end user devices. Right? The, the, the era of general purpose computing seems to be fading. Right? Apple controls what, what is allowed to be on your iPhone and iPad. Right? We, Amazon controls what could be in your Kindle. And, we, and last year, they, they forcibly removed the book. It was, happened to be 1984, which was you couldn't write that stuff. <laughs> you couldn't write that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, I like the feudal metaphor because in a lot of ways, we are pawns. So for example, I, I found this out recently, that while I can, that, that Google and Apple are two feudal lords fighting, and one of the effects is that I can run Google Maps on my iPhone, but not my iPad. Right? Uh, 
Google and Facebook are fighting, and one of the effects is that Google Reader is disappearing. Right? I mean, these things are happening. Uh, these companies are they're protecting us, but they're also selling us. They're using us. And it is very much, and, and I, can, I mean, feudal is kind of half history and half Game of Thrones here. You know, I really mean it as, as a metaphor, not an exact. Uh, and we are members of no house here. Right, we are the right. peasantry. We are the peasantry, right? We, yeah. are, we, are, we, are, we are collateral damage. I mean, dropping Google Reader is collateral damage. The fact that I can't get the maps on my iPad is collateral damage. And if, if you read about historical feudalism, it ended with the rise of the nation state, with things like the Magna Carta. And what basically happened is a, a larger government said to the feudal lords, look, you have all of these rights. You now have to have responsibilities. That, that, that having just one is, you know, is fun for you guys, but no fun for everybody else. And I, I, I want that metaphor to guide what we need to do on the internet. So what's the piece of Westphalia here? I'm not that detailed. <laughs> what I think we need I was is, just thinking the next book is Westphalia. It's not just for ham. Yeah, you know, but nobody would buy that. <laughs> or the people would buy it expecting something very different. Yeah, I... I think we need to recognize that these corporations are de facto states. Which now sounds like Mark Zuckerberg on at least one day he woke up and decided that was an interesting thing to say. Uh, I don't know how much he stands behind I, it. I know, but, but, but I want to regulate him. So yes. he's not going to like where I'm going. Yes. Right? And that we need to rein them in. That that. You know, on the internet, there's no such thing as, as a public space. It's all yes. privately owned. That, but, but we treat these spaces as yes. public. We, we treat these as infrastructure, not as, as corporations. And it's more obscured by the fact that the basic market model, which is I buy something from you, you sell it to me, and then we, we have this, this capitalistic change that, that, that really is the base of the system, fails because we are not customers of these things we use. Right? We are users, we are product, whatever you want to call us. So a lot of this is obscured. So we're laying down markers here. As we're laying down this marker that's roughly by your label in the realm of digital feudalism, let me just uh, mention the kinds of pushback that come to this kind of argument that I'm well familiar with since I <laughs> argued similar things without the same terminology uh, in my work. It's the bumper sticker. Uh, it is. Um, uh, and it's also a form of futileism. So it has a nice double entendre going on, which you appear to need for almost any book cover. Don't blame me. But uh, th the pushback includes, and I'll channel folks like the Mercatus Center or mm -hmm. you know, name your favorite libertarian. Um, the first objection to that is, give me a break, you're a communist. All right, get past that. <laughs> Second is, we have more technological affordances today than we had yesterday, than we had last year. Isn't most of your worry front-loaded to some future that hasn't at least arrived yet? So there is a quality of chicken little, because... I know I can't get Google Maps on my incredible <laughs> iPad mini that didn't exist three years ago. Talk but, about the glass being one million yeah, but, uh, empty. And, sure, but, it, but it's, a lot, it's a lot more than that. You know, we, we know that Google collects this data. I mean, I, I'm worried a lot about government corporate interaction. We know that Google collects this data. And we know that the government asked them for it. I, I read an article, I mean, talking about, uh, I guess, the crazy libertarians about uh, on the, in the gun control. You said crazy. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will say it again, and I will endeavor to prove it if I have to. That, that the, the reason we oppose uh, registering gun owners is because there'll be lists of gun owners the government used to use to confiscate guns. Right? That's the argument. I'm reading this, I'm thinking, why does the government need to get a list? What if they just asked Google? What if they just asked Axicom? 
And, and I think we're seeing more. Remember when? Uh, how does Google know how many gun owners there are? I'm sure. I'm sure in Google's data, if you ask Google who owns guns, I'm sure they'd give you a decent list. Really? Based on search terms, based on on topics discussed, based on purchasing history. I mean, it depends who you ask. The, the the question is, and if not now, when will it happen? I bet it's soon. When will the corporate sphere, just in the data they're collecting about our actions, have that list? Right, we, we know that uh, the TSA, when they were trying to do uh, not secure, it was secure flight, what it was called in like 05 and 06, they wanted to use corporate data to differentially screen passengers. Right? They recognized that data that, that, ex that we are willingly giving these, these companies, they could use for differential law enforcement in, in this case. And I, I wonder if the era of the government needs to know data from us is ending. I, mean, I can imagine the IRS saying, you know, it's hard to figure out how to, who to audit. We're going to go to a credit bureau. We're going we're gonna to ask them to run a differential based on what they think your income is, is it what you said your income is, and we're going to audit people who, uh, who mismatch. This is a good idea or a bad idea? It might, be a, it might be an effective idea. I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, I mean, so, but, but it's an idea that we should discuss the possibility of yes. before they go decide to do it without telling us. Yes. OK, but now, so, so, yep. so, so getting to sort of the, the, the question that I mean, things, are, things are looking really good, why are we worried? You know, we're at a point, and a lot of that is the opt-out answer. You don't like it, don't do it. Don't carry it. But I don't, that's not really possible. I mean, you can't not have a credit card. You, can't, you actually really can't not have a cell phone. Can you not have an iPad? You could not have an iPad, but, but the, your, ch your choices are few. And if the two choices don't compete on the feature you're pissed about, you're stuck. I mean, you can't fly you know, <coughs> more secure airways you run a background check on everybody, or less secure airways we you know, hand you a knife when you get on board. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you don't have that ability. Right? All cell phone plans are The market has not spoken. <laughs> or, or, or at least the few sellers in the market have decided not to speak on that issue. And right? it might just be some one-time flyers. That, right. I mean, there isn't a, 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 a Facebook that won't collect your data. Which is an interesting puzzle, by the way. Why? I don't Maybe we should just do a quick market test, although there's obviously selection bias in who chose to come tonight. But... Uh, how many people would be, how many people are Facebook users? All right, let the record show a lot. How many people um, are a little queasy about Facebook? The record shows more. Um, and how many people would be okay with paying $5 a month and in exchange, Facebook will do zip with any data it collects, it expunges it as it has it and offers you six bucks. We're going to run an auction now. <laughs> <laughs> Just five bucks is a, is a, how many people would pay five? Now, why is, okay. all right, first of all, very, I'd say a, a maybe 20% of the hands went up. Because you, you asked the question wrong. Oh, the question please. is, how many of you are willing to pay five bucks to be in a non intrusive Facebook when all of your other friends are on Facebook? That's the problem. It's the network effect. I mean, well, but it's, it, yeah. uh, if you're not on Facebook, you don't get invited to parties, you don't get dates, you don't get late. But these folks but you, are on Facebook, right. and they're not wanting to pay the five bucks, whether they're on it because they feel they have to be on it, or they're on it because they like it. Either right. way, they're not willing to pay the five bucks for the most part. Sure, and, and some are, and some aren't. I mean, the problem, and the problem we have with a lot of these systems, is is they accrete. You know, we're on Facebook. I, I happen not to me, but I'm a I'm, I'm the Eudora using freak. Wait, who am I friends with then? He you know, like I, you. I, I, honestly, I, I get. It's going to turn out to be Chuck Norris. I get email. I get. I get email from people thanking me for friending them on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know who you're friends with. This does seem poor security, doesn't it? It opens uh, the know, world to spoofing. It, it, it's only so much I can do. <laughs> but now, um, this leads to the other, I think, main objection. Although we may hear more shortly, uh, on this riff of. Mark doesn't like what I have to say because I say I want to regulate them. A big part of your objection to these loci of concentrations of data is that it's very easy for the government to get it. And yet here you are saying, let's have the government come in and regulate these guys. When's the last time the government came in in this space and did something you thought improved the situation? In this space? but I mean, So I, you have to take a long-term view, right? I mean, 
This is the only quote we that We shouldn't lets... tell the senators it's a bill about the internet until the very end. <laughs> longer term, longer term. The, 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 the quote that lets me survive in this world is Martin Luther King, the arc of history is long but bends towards justice. I mean, 100 years ago, half of us in this room couldn't vote. I mean, 200 years ago, a bunch of us were slaves. I mean, in the long term, assuming my, my dystopian vision doesn't happen, governments will do the right thing. How long do we have to wait to do the Facebook regulation you want you to do? You might have to wait 20 years. You might have to wait a generation. You might really? have to wait two years. Yep. Uh, uh, so we haven't even regulated Friendster yet, but it's like, let's keep on. <laughs> you know, let's see how this thing shakes out. Law, okay, I mean, short term, I'm actually very pessimistic. I mean, I, 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 don't think it's, I don't think government can pass a good law at this point. So you're I mean, called I mean, to I mean, testify, Mr. Schneier, should we get into the business of protecting the defenseless American public from these economic engines called Facebook and Google and everything, should we get into this or should we just keep on walking for 20 years? What's your answer? You guys, you money-grubbing senatorial morons, you shouldn't do anything. I Definitely not confirmable. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, we're living in a world with a very dysfunctional government. And this is another one of my threads, that, that, that power is now using itself to increase power. So. While in the near term, I, I have actually no hope for, I mean, I, I, mean, the, I think the update of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act would be a disaster because I can't imagine them making it better. I'd love it to make it better, but I can't imagine it happening. I'm yeah. terrified that they'll get their hands but on it. But if that's the case, I just want to pin you down for a moment here. You I'm do slippery. Have, I know it. <laughs> so you have a theoretical answer that says there ought to be right. some regulatory muscle that could be, but not always is, flexed, that answers to something other than a market, that answers to a right. polity, to deal with certain market failures you've identified. But in the real world, at least for the next 19 and a half years, you ain't going to see it. Or it's going to kick in the wrong direction. Probably. In which case, what should we do right now? I don't know. I mean, I mean, and and, and I, I, I don't know if there's an answer. In a lot of ways, oh well, you're screwed. I mean, I mean what, what do we do? What do we do in the face of, of a government, I mean, a US government that, that doesn't even follow its own law yes. with respect to data collection, and data retention, and data use, that, that carves exceptions into its laws, right? I mean, we've learned recently that the FBI has been, for the past, over the, over the decade, uh, running fake cell towers uh, for surveillance. Uh, Almost certainly against law, right? I mean, NSA is eavesdropping. Uh, we, we're pretty sure that the, uh, the DHS has collected the uh, financial records of everybody uh, under a national security letter. I mean, I mean, I mean these things that are happening are, are you know, I'm sense pretty abhorrent. And I mean, on the other hand, I mean, what we all we can do is keep up, keep fighting. Uh, last week, and I've said this to a few people I've talked to, I don't know if people read Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he wrote a really nice essay on gay marriage where he said, I mean, it was one of the most uplifting things I've read in, the, in, in years. He said, you know, look at what's gone on. We have for years been, been fighting an issue that we had no hope of winning. And in the space of three months, what the hell happened? It all turned around. Whereas it's, now it seems that winning is inevitable. Look, don't give up, which was his, his, his moral which is more general that his moral yeah. was that about that and Guantanamo and all the other things he, yes. he argues about. I don't know. I have to believe that sooner or later, yes. you know, and, and we've got people working. I mean, well, once Larry Lessig solves the money problem, I'm in. So, you know, I, I'm just counting, him, I'm counting on him just to be like a month ahead with the solution. Yes, yes. And as long as that happens, yes. we're good. Internet, question mark, question mark, question mark, Lessig, profit. profit. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Somebody needs to alert him, but th this is uh, progress. Now, you mentioned Glenn Greedwald. That's not a bad segue, because Glenn was one of the people who had been identified as uh, an ally of sorts. Conspirator to, ally. To WikiLeaks, yeah. to, to something. And anonymous, in turn, managed to hack H.B. Gary Federal, mm -hmm. one of the 
be afraid, be very afraid, write us a check, profit, no question mark there. Um, and <coughs> Anonymous was able to completely uh, own them, get all of their internal corporate email, including PowerPoint decks where they made their sales pitches to the likes of Bank of America, and where they proposed a dirty tricks campaign against Glenn Greenwald. And others, but yes. And yeah, others. Yeah. And I'm just curious, I'm, I'm curious, I know that you, you have thoughts about leaks and their value in a society, but I'm curious to really think about the function of something like anonymous. Uh, it feels like a powerful entity that has the feature of not being harnessed to right. the traditional forces that may be not but, great, but it's also not harnessed to anything. How the, do you think about that? There's a lot to be said about, about, about non-state actors. I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, that whole, uh, whole escapade. It, it's, you know, we're living in a world where a bunch of hackers can you know, drop a company. And, and later than, a few, a few months later, and this, this made the news less, anonymous told NATO not to mess with it. We're living in a world where a bunch of guys can threaten NATO. I thought That's you were kind of I freaky. It's interesting, because they've also, I think, weighed in against North Korea, saying your time <laughs> has come. Um, I, I but I, I thought you were going to bring up that Anonymous had a war within itself. And there was a moment, if you, uh, if you went to a, one of Anonymous's main pages, it said, there's a guy who used to be us who compromised our server until further notice, don't visit our website anymore, you might get owned. And at that point, I was just like, yeah. the center cannot hold. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know who the falcon and the falconer is. Anonymous is like a lot of movements that, that, are, that are given. You know, we, we as a species like organization, so we tend to assume the, our enemies organized. Reminds me of the way the Black Panthers were treated in the 60s. Uh, the way Al Qaeda was treated ten years ago, that we assumed it was this organization, you know, with with, with roles and, and hierarchies and an org chart, and you, you drew a salary and got benefits. But it, it, in all those cases, it tends to be random people who pick up the banner and say, "I'm Al Qaeda. I'm anonymous. I'm this." And maybe they're loosely connected. Maybe they're ideologically connected. Maybe they're just using the name. And it's a lot more diffuse. So there. I, you know, there really isn't an, an anonymous. There are the people who today have done things and said, hey, look, we're anonymous. And what's, but what's your thinking around that phenomenon? Uh, I, I think the, uh, the rise in non-state actors is really interesting, uh, that they can do real damage. I mean, it, it, it's, this will be called the next cyber war, but you know, it's not. It's a bunch of guys. Uh, I had another thought that just came, came out of my head. It, it's it, it, so the non-state actors. It, it's their power, uh, not being tied to a population, makes them much more random. And oh, I, I lost it. Oh well, it'll it'll, it'll well, come I back. Just, I, I'll share some of my thinking about it, which is um, there's a paper that talks about uh, an arrangement reached. <laughs> in the American antebellum north and south between political elites about a very contentious issue at the time, the return of fugitive slaves. And the north agreed to return fugitive slaves in order to keep the larger peace. Right. And it turned out that the north couldn't deliver because there wasn't professionalized law enforcement the way there is today. And in order to get pretty much anything done in the law enforcement context, like return a fugitive slave, you had to convene a posse, which was to say you had to ask the citizenry to come help, and the citizenry <laughs> was going to be shampooing their cat that day. Like, they were not <laughs> interested in doing that. And it was an interesting way of applying a template that perhaps subsists or, or persists only now in the uh, tradition of the jury, where before you can just put somebody away, you get 12 citizens, good and true, or however many, and have them be the last ones to weigh in on this. And that is less and less needed as enforcement becomes more push button. Um, we see it with anything ranging from YouTube takedowns to surveillance right. to et cetera. You don't need the posse anymore. And I'm wondering, is the rise of something like Anonymous and many counterparts a reintroduction 
of actually having to get a good portion of the polity in line with something for it to actually happen in the world? Well, or is it something else? You know, I, I think that they are one of the first examples that we've seen of what civil disobedience looks like in the internet age. You know, what, what, it, what it means to protest. What a, what a sit-in looks like. What, what a picket line looks like. What, what, and do you have a view, by the way, on DDoS? Is it sit-in and should be treated as such, but, as Stallman would say? But, or but, is it but, uh, but, but, blocking but, information? But remember, remember what I said in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it used to be you can tell by the weaponry. Now you can't. So a DDoS is either it's been used for extortion. Uh, in, in, it happens, tends to happen most on fringe industries offshore. Online gambling, online gaming, online porn. There is DDoS extortion. It is used for, uh, for, for, for causing damage. It is used as protest. It is used because school's out and we're bored. It, you know, so it's used for all of these things. Actually, uh, there are cases uh, a few years ago, the uh, Victoria's Secret, Secret website went down, not because of a DDoS attack, but because of a lot of people wanted to see the pictures. But you couldn't tell the difference. Not exactly this just in. <laughs> but, 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 but you can't tell the difference. If you were on the receiving end, you can't tell the difference. So Anonymous largely, I believe, engaged in legitimate civil disobedience and should be treated that way. Hmm. Not because of, less because of what they did and because of who they are and why they did it. Hmm. So, and... I mean, this is hard. In the real world, we tend to have not different laws, but different expectations around civil disobedience. So you know that you'll get arrested, and you'll, you know, you'll, you may spend a few hours in jail, and this is all part of, of what we do. But of course, Anonymous, if it's true to its name, wants the impact of civil disobedience without the part of civil disobedience where you go to jail. Now, but, in fairness, but, going to jail for 40 years for something it, wasn't in the cards at a counter sit-in Right, before. because in, in the U.S. at least, we are, and I think we're doing this because uh, of corporate pressure, classifying all of this as you know, these, these horrible crimes against the Internet, and, and, and we, we are really exaggerating what these are. So, I mean, I would want to remain anonymous, too. Uh, we really don't have an agreement among all of us of, of, of what a valid protest is. Now, I mean, defacing a website right, could easily be, you know, I mean, you remember Greenpeace and they, they throw a banner on, 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 a, uh, on a smokestack? I mean, that, that's the equivalent of defacing a website. You, you, you make a public statement that those who are, or it's a picket line. You make a statement that those who are going to where, whatever it is you're protesting have to see it, have to interact with it. You know, but, it, but if you do it on the net, you are a cyber criminal and, and you get uh, a, a really exaggerated sentence. I mean, you, bunches of examples. And if your view, years. though, I, I just want to dwell on this for one moment. If somebody manages online to disrupt things not just in an expressive kind of way. Vandalism is almost mm -hmm. the easiest case for online protest. It's the graffiti kind of. Right. But manages to do so in a way that, you know, PayPal or MasterCard, not just the brochure front page, but the actual functionality. The APIs aren't working for a while, and a bunch of commerce grinds to a halt. You're saying, in your view, the motive of such an attack would be material to you in wanting to figure out how to treat it. That feels in, in line with... with with the way law works, I mean, we, we do look at, at motive, you know, uh -huh. accidental homicide versus murder. It, well, in this case, it's intentional homicide, but one was for a cause and I, the other was for money. Okay, so, so, so it's less, hmm? sorry? That's what we call war, intentional homicide. I, indeed. I mean, so I think, I think motive actually does matter. I mean, I think, and I think it matters in all, in all crimes. Hmm. I mean, I, I've, always, I've always wondered why you can be, tried for murder over here with these horrible penalties and attempted murder over here with much fewer penalties based on like something as weird as how good your aim is. <laughs> I mean, does that make any sense to, I mean, it makes no sense to me. It seems like if that's what you wanted to do, why should like, or, or maybe how, how much the wind was blowing or how lucky, you know, I mean, why should your penalty be based on factors that have nothing to do with intent? Hmm. 
Now, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> so there's probably good reasons. Because, I mean, certainly it's easier to measure the effects than the intent, right? So, I mean, my guess is that as, as we, we invent law, we could do the hard thing, but it's way easier to do the easy thing and just hope it's it basically sends it It's funny that it puzzles you on the negative. I wonder how much it puzzles you on the positive. Should we give a Nobel Prize for an effort? Like, Phlogiston, I'm sorry it didn't pan out, <laughs> but there was a lot of work that went into that. It was pretty genius. It just wasn't true. But there's, there's, a, there's a difference there, because there you actually are awarding a result. Right? You're not awarding... You, you're not passing. I mean, you could give. You can. It give. would be funny if somebody accidentally cured cancer and won the Nobel <laughs> Prize, and the speech was just like, "It can happen to you too." This will be like the Beverly Hillbillies of science. Yes, that's right. Black DNA gold. That would and that would make a great Caltech T. That would make a great sitcom because now he's faculty at Harvard right. and he doesn't know a thing, and he's now got to teach and. Wow. <laughs> a less unusual situation than you would think. But uh, so um, I feel like we should open it up. And uh, to do so, and it's being recorded, I think. It's not oh, going God, live, no. but it will be produced at your hearing. Um, <laughs> we should see, is there a, uh, at least one handheld so that there won't be the annoying phenomenon of questions are asked, but the multitudes who watch it later don't. So let's just let these handhelds find <laughs> repose. And I guess my only suggestion, aside from the usual try not to speak unduly long, is I'm happy to try to engender a conversation more than a ping pong back and forth. So we'll weigh sure. in when we're moved, but let's have a conversation. So here's a hand, here's a hand, <laughs> here are mics. And also feel free to say who you are. Or not, because it's being recorded. Okay. Hi, Daniel Dern. I see enough scenarios here that we don't have the week to talk about it. But on one hand, you know, Bruce, you, you go to a restaurant, you get ready to, your hamburger comes, and then the guy at the register says, I'm sorry, Mr. Schneier, but the restaurant computer refuses to sell you another hamburger this week because, you, you know, because your medical records say that's all you're allowed until next Thursday. On the other hand, somewhere in the basement of the FBI, there's a big master switch that says, all cars except ours, stop. You know, cruise, cruise to a safe stop and don't move. Or even... The Which US, is the more terrifying scenario? Right. Or, or, <laughs> or, even the United, or even the government says, all network routing devices must use our code, sure. you know, et cetera, and we're not telling you what's in it. Like China is trying to do. I mean, right? So, and th th that's not even that's not even theoretical. So I'm, I'm, I have to choose. I'm not sure it's the scenarios. I'm not, yeah, I mean, I mean, which is the most terrifying? And I got to say, Bruce does run a semi-annual movie plot <laughs> contest. It's true. So you're already you got two entries going there. And I, as I understand the rules, it's to come up with as scary and yet realistic a plot as possible, but one for which. There's no cognizable specific policy that the government could do that it was a res would be a response. So, so the to phrase it? "movie plot threat" I, I coined to be, I mean, and you see these these overly specific scare stories you'll hear in an effort to to make you afraid. That you sounds like a great Showtime series. Overly specific scare stories. Well, but but you remember that. <laughs> remember remember the terrorists with scuba gear, the terrorists with almanacs. I mean, all of those sorts of you know they make great movie plots, but you don't want to craft policy around them, yet those are... And, and when I first did the contest, I, I, I got email from saying, oh my god, how could you give the terrorists ideas? <laughs> like, people actually thought that the hard part of terrorism was the idea. That once you told them, <laughs> look, you can, you can bomb a dam, they'd say, god, why didn't I think of that and run off and do it? So uh, just <laughs> on that one point for a moment, there is... I don't know how many people remember this, but back in the day, there was that movie Independence Day. They're making a sequel. They're making a sequel. Arbor Day. <laughs> They're just going down the whole federal <laughs> holiday calendar. <laughs> um, and the British internationalized counterpart, Bank Holiday. <laughs> Bank Holiday 2. Anyhow, I'm now confusing myself with what my question was. Independence Day, the trailer came out. And that trailer featured the White House being blown to bits. And I don't know how many people happen to have remembered being in the theater the first time you saw that trailer. 
I at least remember feeling like, whoa, that was intense. <laughs> and the reaction of the rest of the theater was kind of a stunned silence, wow. even though there have been plenty of B-movies that show Godzilla tearing cities apart. And even within the cycle of that trailer, by the time it was getting stale, people were laughing at it. And of course now, I think there are two movies being released this week, which is like, <laughs> the White House blows up even more. <laughs> and there is maybe something, I wonder, about making certain things more thinkable, not by a contest right, not right. on a blog, but by making mainstream certain acts. I, I think so. I, I want to address the, uh, the, the original the, 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 the hamburger. Yes. I mean, basically, what we're saying is, do we want the government to regulate our choices? That's the question. And we do all the time, right? The, the pharmaceuticals you can buy, uh, that hamburger, you know, can't have more than, there's some amount of bug parts that are allowed and some that are too much. It's not zero. It, on the selling side, it, as, as, are you saying we, you cannot sell raw milk? Right. Yeah, okay, okay. Seems okay. awfully hard to buy it if people can't no, sell no, it, it, it. But okay, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. There's. There might be. I mean, okay. Yeah. Then on the on the uh, take take drugs on the prescription side. You know, some people can buy this pharmaceutical. The rest of us can't because there's a mechanism by which you can you can get it. Uh, we as society. I mean, there's a long riff here. I, I think you can make a reasonable argument that modern advertising is an unfair trade practice that it is no longer a seller informing a potential buyer of the virtues of his product, and it's now deliberate psychological manipulation. Uh, I can't think of any other reason I'm buying most of the stuff I buy. <laughs> and, uh, so working backwards, I can't be to blame. So I mean, I mean, a, 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 along with my riff on, on libertarianism is completely wrong, is the notion that, and there's a lot of psychological studies to back this up, that the point of sale is a terrible place to gauge preferences, that that you know, that all, on the long term people want to eat better. On the short term, man, that hamburger looks good. I mean, I ate one of those damn che Chex Mix bags when I came in here. You know, I would have been way happier. <laughs> this if they session didn't exist. sponsored by Chex. <laughs> <laughs> right, I would have been way happy. I mean, this is why we have. This is why we we've adopted term limits. Right, please pass a law to prevent me from exercising my preferences. Right, but, but that Bruce, is a truly let, wacky thing. Let me interject right here because this so nicely fits into your earlier riff about Facebook and Google are kind of, you can't just say it's market, they're kind of right. have an advantage and that's why government should come in. So the analogy here would be one reason they might not sell you the hamburger is because you signed up ahead of time and said, no matter what I do, right, don't sell the right, Ulysses please stop thing. Me. Yeah, you're <laughs> the other reason might be some Bloombergian, Sunsteinian nudge or something. <laughs> Where they are actually doing their best to remind you of the kind of mm -hmm. commitments you want, or the burgers have to be served with blue buns, and they may get less <laughs> esculent that way, whatever it is. But, we are, but, and, but that's an example of the government intervening to save us from the market. Right. Because, so because, I, who's worse in this c well, circumstance, but, Bloomberg or Big Gulp? Well, but, but, but so we, we, these manipulations are happening. I mean, in your grocery store. Store, uh, products are paying for eye level placement. Ones that don't pay get high or low. Uh, those big gulps were, were designed for you to. So to if the government more. intervenes to well, somehow. Are someone's intervening. Someone's intervening. I mean, yes. Intervention is happening. We, can't, we can either say no intervention, which maybe we can do, or we can try. I mean, and, and this is where I have trouble with solutions, but my guess is that solutions will be the multiple distrustful parties each keeping the other in check. So do we want government intervention to limit corporate intervention? I mean, and and I, I think some solution will have a corporate component, a government component, an NGO component, that everybody will be sort of keeping an eye on everybody else. Uh, of course, this could fail. I mean, I thought this is the way the US government was supposed to work, but yeah. post 9-11, Everybody fell down on the job, right? The, the you know Congress wouldn't wouldn't keep the president in check. The court said, oh, I don't need you, you, you keep me out of this. I, but in theory, uh, that's the sort of system I want to yeah. work. Well, at the very least, it means one can retreat to. We really need a self-conscious dialogue about what kinds of forces. We, you know, yeah, that I, at I, least I, you know, it's not I, much, I, but it's I, something. I'm a, and I'm a big fan of of, of this uh, of the susting nudges, and I, because the. 
even though they are manipulation. But, but the manipulation is happening anyway. I mean, this is, this is my unfair trade practices argument, that, that we're being manipulated for profit. I mean, I, maybe it's not that bad to be manipulated for benevolence. Yeah. Now, the question is, of course, who decides what benevolence is? I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot right, of right, devil right. in the details, but there's a whole lot of devil if you don't do these details. Yes. Uh, well, as was promised, this is a week's worth of stuff. Is there anything you want to say about the FBI turning off all our cars, which when I put it that way makes it sound absurd, but in fact, no, but you, no, the you, more you, that you, devices you, are you, tethered, you, the you, more a government can ask. But, but, and, so and, you want to say something about that before we and, 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 and we've seen requests for that. You know, in the event of a terrorist emergency, can the government shut off the Internet? I mean, this is being asked. Yeah. I mean, cars is going to be uh, driverless cars, high-speed chase. We need the ability to turn off cars on this highway for the safety of everybody. I mean, you, you, can, you can see how... That could make sense. Right, because or at least how that would be requested. Yeah. But uh, Internet kill switch has been debated. I mean, I mean, I mean, to me, that's fundamentally crazy for a whole lot of other reasons. You know, I... I should say, in fairness, the, at the time it was debated, the senators pushing the bill that was said to contain it said, this bill doesn't contain that. In fact, the government has long since had that authority <laughs> since amendments to the Communications Act made in the wake of Pearl Harbor. So um, there is, I think, I the right the debate inter- about I missed that. the internet provision in, that was passed yes. in the 40s. It's yes. <laughs> um, so we should keep the conversation going. Have the mics found another home? Uh, how about over here? Got someone there. So this is not my opinion in particular, but I've been exposed to the opinion by people in this computer security community that the way in which to deal with these sorts of problems is that rather than uh, is that everybody should be responsible for their own information technology security, that everybody should learn the skill set in full, and that if you don't learn the skill set, that it's your own problem. Dan Gear is one of the yeah. people who's talked about an internet driver's license. The problem is it's, an, it's, it's actually not only your problem. You know, we are, we are too interconnected. I mean, if you think of DDoS attacks and bots, your security is very directly a function of whether my mother remembers to turn her firewall back on. Because if she doesn't, there are more insecure computers being used for more things. But I guess one question here is how much low-hanging fruit is there in trying to get grandma to turn on the firewall? Of all the things that right. make security hard, is there some space comparatively I, I, to try to honestly, make user education? I, I'm not a big fan of user education. I think user education is a cop-out. I think user education is a cop-out when computer security people like me design crap systems. I mean, you, you, get, these, you get these warnings, right? You see them on your computer, uh, complex security thing, blah, 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 blah. Do you want to continue? Yes, no. And you, what you read is blah, 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 blah. Make this, bu- make this dialog box go away. Right? That's what you read. And you click. Make Would you like to continue box. with what you're doing? <laughs> right, right. OK or right. cancel? Would you like me to stop annoying you? <laughs> uh, you know, it, is, it is rare that the user can make a better decision. I can't wait for the Firefox plugin called Yes Man <laughs> that just answers all dialog boxes OK. Yeah. I'm patenting that. You know, so, so I, I, I want systems that are robust enough to deal with an uneducated user. I mean, I, we can't legitimately say you have to, you know, you, you need to pass a skill test to use the internet. We, we, it'll be real hard to turn it into something like driving a car. And, and I'm not sure we want So that. right now, just uh, share with us your best conception of the process of a user checking email from a server, whoever the provider might be, what would be the best practice using today's technology so that the email provider could make it as secure (laughs) as possible without the user having to be anybody other than grandma? You know, what we have today is mostly good. I I, I like seeing the uh, additional authentication mechanisms. I like seeing the backup authentication mechanisms improved. You know, it's, it's not a lot. So you don't see anything out there that isn't already kind of working yeah, its way in. Yeah, and this is, this is a surprise. This is a surprise really from, from your, when, your book. When I read your book, you made a really good point that, that openness is so much better and that, that a closed system will be rejected. And I believe that too, and we got it wrong. People love the iPhone. And an iPhone is a very close... Uh, I, iPhone is giving you more security because they regulate 
what goes on that platform. Right? And, and it turns out, much to my annoyance, that people like that. I mean, and this is the problem with the feudal metaphor. We, 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 we like these feudal systems because my mother does a way better job with her photos on Flickr. It's really better for her to be on Gmail. It's better for her, her calendar and her dress book. She loses her phone. She gets a new one, pushes a button. It all appears magically. Right? For the average user, this feudal trade-off isn't that bad. I'd like it to be worse, but it turns out not to be. Right? Because the cost my mother is paying is largely invisible. It's largely long-term. Right, it's, it's, it's the and along solely the dimension of security against third-party attack, it right. may well be more secure for her. It almost certainly is. Uh, yes. but, uh, but even against the thing I'm more worried about, I'm, what I'm more worried about the third-party attack is she making a mistake. Right? You, know, you make a mistake and you lose your photos, you lose your email, you, you, your hard drive no longer works. It's robust against the naive user, yes. which is really valuable. Yes. Because if we want a, an internet to be socially useful, it has to be technologically easy. Yes. Ethan Zuckerman. <clears throat> uh, hi, guys. I, I wanted to return to this idea of, of the asymmetric attack and the notion that the bad guys get way ahead of the good guys and what this makes us think about open and closed environments. And Bruce, I was working on my entry for the movie plot, and I put together two current events. Uh, one current event was this strange little paper where someone claims that they infected 100,000 cable set-top boxes and used them to make a map of the internet. Hard to verify, but a fairly convincing paper <laughs> suggesting that someone built a little worm that was capable of getting into many, 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 many set-top boxes. And roughly at the same time, a really big D, uh, DDoS attack using DNS amplification, which we've all known about for a very long time, but swamping spam house, our friends and sometimes enemies who try to knock out internet spam under 300 gigabits per second of traffic, a level that many of us thought was kind of unfeasible for those <laughs> things. You put the two of those together and you suddenly have a scenario in which everyone's cable box compromised becomes part of a giant DDoS network hitting DNS and knocking out servers. And, and for the no, first time- No, no, you, time, you have to have a broadcast fake news. Then you've got a really good James Bond plot. So, so As if the, that's for, not already for the, happening. For, for the first time- <laughs> People would not notice. People People might not notice. For uh, the first sorry. time in all of this, I found myself sort of looking at this and going, maybe I'm actually scared about this. Maybe I've actually hit the point where these open systems that for years we've known are riddled with holes because we are idiots about security, but we are so resilient because we share information very quickly, we adapt, so on and so forth. I find myself wondering if we're hitting a point where not just on the consumer devices, where I think you're absolutely right, Bruce, that, that people in many cases are preferring the safer environments, whether we're going to hit this point on the actual core net. Do we think that we might be reaching a tipping point on this? Is that part of what's reflected in you writing something that's significantly depressing? And the follow-up to this is, is this going to shake Zitrain at all on this, who thus far has been really good about sort of coming back and saying, yeah, in general, we're willing to trade a lot to make sure that we have the openness out there, and so far it hasn't been this in the butt. Is this finally the time we get bit? So I, I think I mean, that's a good example. So, and my worry is, is really that the fear of these things will lead the actuality. I mean, uh, this whole weapons of mass destruction debate is largely a fear debate. The cyber war debate is largely a fear debate. These are not based on realistic threats. but. You know, that 10, 20, 30 years, they, they, they likely will be. Uh, I'm afraid you have a point. Um, I find myself wanting to say, especially when I ran into that spam house situation, I find myself wanting to say, yes, this is exactly <laughs> what I predicted. Because my book wasn't, things are great, <laughs> except people are paranoid and the paranoia is going to destroy us. That was not the theme. It was, things may be great now, but the better they get, the higher the stakes are for somebody to find value in making it worse. And unless we come up with a defense to it, 
that is constructed along the lines of what made it great to begin with, namely a distributed civic defense for a distributed civic network, the most obvious defense when the trolls come is going to be a centralized response, a militarized response, and that's bad. So I think that fits the template in the sense of people are a little bit kind of asleep at the switch or a collective action problem. There ought to be ways, and there have been ways suggested, to secure border gateway protocol, to secure DNS service and DNS um, uh, uh, servers, uh, because each of those cable boxes contains a DNS resolver. Who knew? That is a public proxy? Like, what? So these are the kinds of things that either might be so specific a movie plot right. that it's hard to go just closing doors after horses leave, but that actually had been long anticipated. And if the community that has roughly existed to build this distributed collective hallucination to begin with could come up with the distributed defense of it, so far, the way Wikipedia has managed to do with the content layer, a distributed content generation system that contains its own defense, not just against garden variety and accuracy, but against every page being turned into an ad for a Rolex watch, which you can guarantee is being attempted as we speak. Um, that gives me hope. I just worry yeah. that the paranoia generated by the very real dangers represented by that incident will have us just say, we've got to send the Marines somewhere. And I, I agree with the paranoia worry. I mean, any solution is going to look like some form of resilience. And whether it's, I mean, the Wikipedia distributed type of resilience, whether it's something built into the internet, you know, there'll be different, different aspects of it. But in a world, I mean, we, we're seeing people today calling the cyber, the cyber threat an existential threat to humanity. Those words are being used by actual policymakers. That is fundamentally a crazy thing to say. But, you know, getting past that is going to be a realization that, you know, 9 11, you know, the, 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 the existential threat was not this terrorist attack, it was a reaction to it. That if, if we have a if we come from, not from fear, but from indomitability, I mean, imagine if, if that's what you know, President Bush got up and said, yes, this is horrible, yes, we're going to be after them, yes, we're, gonna, we're going to achieve justice, but our country is better than this, we're not going to, you know, the things they killed us for, are not, we're not going to change because they tried. I mean, the, those sorts of, of ways, and, and I think that rhetoric makes a huge difference. But see, up to the minute, Bruce Schneier, who worries about asymmetric offense, I'm and not, says we have an I, existential you threat. You know, I mean, we, we said in the beginning this is not a consistent talk. Yes. <laughs> well, it is and it isn't. Sorry. <laughs> it's my for, <laughs> cheap shot. I'm sorry. Um, other mics. Yes, back here. Hi, I'm Gilly. I'm a senior at the college here and a former Berkton. Um, so it seemed that the most pragmatic solution we have come up with thus far is to start a discussion. Um, so I want to ask about how to frame that discussion. I think that the role of metaphors has sort of come up here and, and we talked about war as a metaphor and it's sort of both a conflation of the threat and the use of notions from national security. And then another thing that Bruce seems to support uh, to me is the um, public health metaphor in a sense, you know, the Bloomberg intervention and the sort of making sure grandma turns on the, <coughs> the firewall again. Um, are there any other metaphors we should be considering and should we be aware of these metaphors and what they imply? And how I, mean, I think the metaphors are extraordinarily important. I mean, the, we, I mean just taking the, 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 the cyber war metaphor, when you use the word more, war, you invoke a certain solution space, right? right? Things, certain things that wouldn't be considered are reasonable when you're at war. Uh, for, for these type of cyber attacks, I much prefer a, a, a police metaphor. And actually, for terrorism, I much prefer a police metaphor. And I think it's more accurate, and I think that we as a people would make better trade-offs. Right? You know, when it's war, when the NSA goes to you and says, you know, can I eavesdrop on every phone call? Well, you don't say, where's your warrant? You say, OK, you know, put the stuff in the closet up there, don't tell anybody. And that's because your thinking is war. So uh, you know, I find the war metaphor dangerous. Uh, 
I, I like a public, I think a public health model, I think actually I think biological metaphors are in general useful for the internet. That there's a lot of analog, I mean, n not the least of is viruses. And it's funny, we're starting to see that go back. We're starting to see the, the, the term virus came from health. We're starting to see these ways that we're thinking about computer viruses going back into the medical community. And they're using some of the tools we've developed for computer viruses to look at the spread of, of actual biological viruses. Uh, right, the, the, the metaphor of how the internet, the internet stateless versus stateful, not, not, uh, not from a, a, a finite state, but, but for a government perspective. I mean, the, the, the metaphor of the 90s, remember the, the, the internet is, is outside of any nation state, right, is turning out to be not true at all. And, and there's more censorship than ever. And, and, and now there's a rise thing that is called the cyber sovereignty movement, which would terrify all of us. Right, where countries are, are saying, look, you know, the, all of every piece of the internet is in somebody's border. And the ones that are in my border, I get to control. Right, and the, uh, this is the ITU getting involved. Uh, a lot of this, I, I think you fight on the level of metaphor. You get the right metaphor. Magical things happen. <laughs> it, it, it really frames the debate. These debates are hard. They're technical. They're confusing. And the metaphors matter an enormous amount. For what it's worth, the metaphor I'm most uh, intrigued by these days is mutual aid. And if I'm in a, uh, a military environment, I'll call it a NATO for cyberspace. But elsewhere, it's mutual <laughs> aid. Um, that tries to push against the idea of, I wrote my check give me internet, and if there's a problem with it, it's a customer service issue, that a lot of what built it was a form of mutuality. And there may be useful ways for people to be able to help one another with cycles and bandwidth, with um, expertise, and even at the content layer um, in times of real crisis. That is it a good thing to imagine, should something happen, natural disaster or otherwise, uh, my 3G goes down, my Wi-Fi isn't going anywhere, I'm stuck. But what if my phone were a two-way radio that could talk to every other two-way radio in the room? And what if my Facebook credentials were cached and I could then say, are any of my Facebook friends in this ad hoc network? And if they are, I'd like to send them a message. And is there anybody in the network that has a pre-cached root certificate that says I'm from the government and I'm here to help because I'd like some help? Um, those are examples to me of mutual aid in action. It's not a solution to every problem, but it tends to be overlooked right. because it isn't all that helpful in many other public safety defense operations that the other metaphors tend to invoke. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I like to like infrastructure metaphors. Yeah, but Sun had the, the idea of the internet dial tone. I, I kind of like that. I mean, and, and I think there's something to be said for starting to realize that the internet is Infrastructure is a utility. is not, you know, is not optional. It's like water. It's like power. I think that's valuable. I mean, there. I, I B British Telecom had a great slogan a, a couple of years ago, called "Innovation at the Speed of Life." Now they meant it to mean going really fast, and I thought of it and said, "Wouldn't it be neat to have it slow down like that?" Hmm. I'm thinking about the cereal. <laughs> Um, OK, so uh, why don't we take a few more questions? We only have 14 minutes left. Wow. So my checking. suggestion is that we take some thoughts. And they're going to pile up and be specific. But uh, Bruce has a pen. He's going to write some stuff down. I just want to get some more voices in um, as we go. So please. Uh, so I'm less concerned about threats from the internet to humans, but threats from humans to the internet. Um, and if you look at World War II or World War I, uh, where you had you know, a, a global scale conflict, you saw um, letters sort of being smuggled across borders. And there were, some communication was possible, but it was extremely limited. I'm curious what, um, if the internet can exist post a global scale conflict, where nations are rebuilding their networks, um, and whether the internet can exist during a global scale conflict, and uh, what your thoughts on that are. Uh huh. Let's take some uh, other. Questions wherever the mics happen to be. This may, I realize, favor people on the periphery, but yes? I'm Eric. I'm a 2L law student. Um, 
so you mentioned that speaking about anonymous that we're going to call it the next cyber war but it's not it's just a bunch of random guys um and yet your emphasis on the asymmetry of attack and defense seems to run against the idea that war can't be about random guys and i uh, i just like some comments on that got it i was going to ask you about government policy too but we'll i let you succeed. Uh, where's the other mic? Yep. I was going to suggest that the reason you got a tepid response to would you pay $60 for a, a less data collecting Facebook is that it would be a less useful Facebook. You would be losing all of the people who like X also like Y suggestions that people tend to actually like getting. Facebook, Facebook comes back and says, for you, we'll still keep that for your five bucks. Would that get your hand up? I don't know. It's, it's sort of at war with but it, 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 data. It, In other words, you think what you hate is also what you like. In, in general, people tend to like the primary uses. Everyone likes Amazon suggesting books they like based on books they bought. What people tend to dislike are the secondary uses, that Amazon then sells that data to somebody else and it propagates out. We tend to be OK with the immediate recommender systems and, and the immediate systems. Although it is interesting to imagine those applied to people uh, suggesting, well, people who like this will like this other person, right. especially in a real environment rather than just Facebook. And that is, yeah, getting really close. People who attended it? this lecture might like to attend the lecture next <laughs> yeah. week. Yeah. Um, where are the other mics? Are they, yep. Um, on the subject of Anonymous, I'm just wondering how much you think Anonymous is sort of a reaction to a loss of faith in the government. For example, with WikiLeaks, people who supported WikiLeaks didn't have really a standard way of aiding the, it within the system. It wasn't like the FBI was standing up and saying, well, WikiLeaks may or may not be legal, but we're going to hunt down these people who are doing DDoS on WikiLeaks. So Anonymous is sort of people who said, well, our only option is to go DDoS other people, and then we can sort of defend. I WikiLeaks guess this is the way. Batman theory of uh, yeah. uh, yes. the Times call for the person. Is the other mic floating around somewhere? Oh, right there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, to, to go back to the feudal metaphor. Oh, my name's Hal Hodson. Um, to go back to the feudal metaphor briefly. Um, I guess the feudal system became bad when people started getting hurt. And you could kind of imagine that at the beginning it was rather nice. Kind of like at the beginning. Episode one. Yeah. yeah. And you of can the kind of imagine at the beginning Google was rather nice, and it was. Oh. So what, what's the, the internet company equivalent of, you know, killing peasants because you don't, because you know, you, you're pissed off? Like, what's, what's going to happen? What are, what are the damage equivalents for internet companies of the feudal I think the problem? loss of Google Reader is the one we got right now. Google Reader is hardly, you know, killing villagers. What, what's going to hurt me? Google Reader is just inconvenient. What's yeah. actually going to harm me? I, I, don't th I, I don't think you, you took get... away my free product. <laughs> <laughs> I, How dare you? I don't, I don't think you Ben get... and Jerry's, I want ice cream every day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you get that kind of harm. I mean, it's, it is the internet. I mean, it's not the real world. So you're not going to get, you're not going to get Facebook. As Captain Kirk would say, <laughs> for how long, Mr. Schneier? For I, how long? You're not going to get Facebook spearing its users. I mean, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> well, there's at least a silver lining to his pessimism. Um, now, I know we've piled up a lot of questions. You wanted, is there anything you wanted to say on what's happened so far before we open it up again? Well, I mean, is, the, the question I thought was the, the, the notion of, 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 you know, can can a bunch of guys declare war? They can do something, but I, I think you know, war is, is a very specific thing, and it's something nation states do. I, I argue that what a bunch of guys do, even if it's damaging, and, and there's a lot of history, but organized crime does, it can do a lot of damage. We, what, a couple of weeks ago, had uh, someone assassinate a, a, a prosecutor in Texas. And then last way, and, and, and I think this is very much, it, I, I don't know if it's terrorism, I don't, I don't know what to call it, but a couple of days ago, another prosecutor has, has stepped off a case prosecuting the Aryan Brotherhood because he fears for his life. I mean, this is a, a, a violent action to change policy. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what to call it, but, you know, these, if these things, even though they're, they're, they're bad, even though they kill people, they're not war. And war to me is nation state versus nation state. And yes, there are these new sorts of asymmetric threats, and they are important, but is the war metaphor the proper way to deal with it? I mean, and, and we screwed this up, right? We, 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 were, t we were attacked in 9-11, and in response, we invaded a country. 
Because that's what militaries do. If the FBI were in charge, we wouldn't have invaded a country, because that's not what the FBI does. Now, we can argue whether invading a country was the right thing to do, but there was no actual debate about it, because the war metaphor was immediately invoked. It is funny to think if the president, in the wake of 9-11, had said, we are starting a full criminal investigation, the US attorney in but, the but, Southern but, District, which is what we he did, would have been run out on a rail. Which is what we did with every other yeah. terrorist attack to date. Yes. I mean, that's what we did after yeah. uh, Mumbai. That's, I mean, uh, uh, not Mumbai, the, uh, uh, Kenya. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, uh, right. The but it is there. interesting to see, that's what happened nearly a decade later, that choice, which may well have been sort of mm -hmm. by democratic accountability a somewhat uh, forced one to assign, I, I, that's no doubt debatable. Um, it was psychologically the right choice, unfortunately. But it's interesting that choice then persists in the sense that attempts to downshift into a let's try these folks in mm -hmm. the criminal system mode still results in a right. lot of pushback. I mean, remember that yeah. the, we were trying to bring uh, one terrorist from Guantanamo to New York to try him. And, and, right, there was actual fear we couldn't put him in a US jail. And I'm thinking, I mean, what is he, Magneto? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> right? he's just a guy. Yeah. But there, there's, there is, is this fear. I think Obama had, had the opportunity to change it yeah. when he took office. He could have said, and it's a perfectly reasonable reaction that when you actually the Congress actually passed a statute yes, in preventing part of the him. Authorization Act that prevented it. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was one other quick thought too on uh, your notion about when you have prosecutors withdrawing from cases out of fear for their mm -hmm. physical safety. And that's what happened in the U.S. Right. right. That, hap that happens in other countries. Or other countries where States. you have judges wearing hoods right. or that kind or, of I mean, thing. That happens in Mexico. That, ha that doesn't happen but in the U.S. But it gets back to the question of if our own primary institutions are faltering, does that push for alternatives? And it, to me, it calls to mind a book uh, to be published by Yale University Press called The Cartoons That Shook the World. Uh, a very scholarly treatment, peer-reviewed, of the Mohammed cartoons oh, wow. from Denmark. And it included not only the cartoons in question, but depictions of Mohammed over the centuries. And Yale University Press did a security review <laughs> prior to going ahead with publication <laughs> and concluded that it was not safe to publish and insisted that all of the cartoons and all of the other depictions be removed from the book. And the book was still published over the objections of the author. It was removed. The book was published without them. And when Yale responded to assertions that they were kind of giving in to uh, uh, threats of violence uh, kind of thing, they said, well, you know, you can just get to them on Wikipedia. So what did you need <laughs> us for it? And it's an interesting kind of point that Wikipedia, there's not even enough of a there there to decide whether to take the cartoons <laughs> off, that they're a click away. And in fact, there is a discussion, uh, a talk tab on the page about the cartoons on Wikipedia, talking about offending sensibilities, not threats of physical violence. And they decided it would be a very small thumbnail, and then you could click if you wanted there. That was the Wikipedian's solution. But that, the problem. That, that goes to his point of, of, yes. of, of anonymous being right. a loss of That's what I mean. A loss yeah. of fa and, I, and I think in, if you sort of look at, at their activism, it is both a frustration at the institutions who are, who, are be, who are behaving badly and a belief that the institutions aren't, aren't going to follow through on what they should do. So my guess is the mics are in two hands currently or about to be. Let's do those last two mics, and then we should wrap. Where are they? Ah, right okay. here, sir. Adrian Gropper, you invoked Lessig and the gay marriage flip. And uh, the question is, how optimistic can we be that the nation state becomes redefined by the internet in time to save us from this apocalypse? That is, that is the question. So, right, so the question really is, is the relative speed of social change, political change, and technological change. Right? That's your question. It's a really good one. <laughs> Detecting a theme in tonight's uh, talk. Yes. Hi, Pete Devlin. Uh, I was wondering whether, at least in some cases, uh, we don't have to be so afraid that the government has access to our data. So we talked about 
um, them using our financial data to decide who to audit. And if they're mining through our data, uh, everyone's anonymous as they're going through until you are identified as someone likely to have uh, committed tax fraud. And whereas before the internet, they would have had to uh, break into your house, um, look around, see if the pool is in the back or not. Uh, and that seems to me like a much more fundamental invasion of privacy than just seeing your anonymous data and then pulling out the committers. And in a lot of cases, you can build you can build privacy preserving systems. I mean, all, I mean, already we allow the police a remarkable level of intrusion into our lives. We we do that willingly, but we put in a security mechanism. Right, the uh, the warrant process is meant to be a security mechanism. So I will allow the police to intrude in my life, but they have to first convince a neutral third party that it is in society's best interest to do so. There are rules about telling me they did it after the fact. There's a whole lot of mechanisms, not to limit what the police can do, but to limit how they can do it. And so that, that's our trade-off, to make that work. Now, those sorts of trade-offs are certainly possible in all of these technological type of, of surveillances, investigations, data collections, we're not doing any of them. Uh, you know, an example is in uh, full body scanners at airports. Right? They're, they're, you can either see the picture or you can blur out the, the human form and, and see a stylized picture and just the contraband object you're looking for. Right? You know, they, they're both technologically the same. Uh, Larry Lessig does the, does the great point of, of, of the license plate. Right, the police say, look, we need to know who's dr who driving the cars because the cars are hitting things and killing people and driving away, and that sucks. Right, our idea, the police says, is to put everybody's name on the back of the car. Right, someone says, wait, don't do that. that. That loses anonymity. Put a random number on the back of the car. We will give you, the police, the database of random numbers attached to people, and that way you can look cars up when you need to. Right, that, that's a mechanism that, pres that gives the police what they wanted, but preserves privacy. And there are a lot of really clever things we can do T to do that. We're just not doing them. Which also tends to raise the question that often divides engineers and lawyers. And you kind of gave the lawyer's answer, descriptively speaking, which is, well, we can hash it. We'll have a table. And then the government can consult the table when it has good cause. And often the engineering answer is, I never trust them to have good cause. <laughs> I want a fake yeah. license plate, or no license plate, or something there's an, like that. There's an argument to made, to made that one of the solutions here to you know, the very invasive police measures is to give the police better tools. Yeah. Right? The reason, I mean, they're, they're just trying to do their job in most cases. Yeah. And, and it's a job we want done. And the reason they have to be so, so expansive is, is there's no, there are, we don't have the surgical tools. And if we could design them, we'll have a better chance of having them not do the things we don't want them to do. So speaking of engineers and lawyers, this event is <laughs> co-sponsored by the Center for Research on Computation and Society at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the Berkman Center for Internet and Society of Harvard University, but often identified with Harvard Law School. Um, and I think tonight's conversation has been as kaleidoscopic and freewheeling <laughs> as it was promised to be. Um, and we're still trying to figure out uh, how to make the most of a physical gathering like this, a gathering augmented by the various technologies we know are happening at the moment in the background. There could have been a big Twitter feed or something on the screen behind us. Um, but these are threads of conversation, I think, that show first how hard this stuff is and not purporting to have answers where we don't yet have them. And that also really cause us, I think, to ask, how many of our solutions can be general type solutions, a sort of approach that can work from zone to zone to zone, or how much of it is just trying to fix one leak at a time and do so in a way that may feel like your movie plot example, which is you just keep closing barn doors. Um, but it provides, I think, a lot of puzzle that we continue to work on in venues very different from a, a public lecture. We're very hopeful uh, that Bruce will continue to be in our environments here in Cambridge uh, and virtually, and that we'll have chance to continue the kinds of conversations that are happening here. And, and I actually, actually really appreciate the conversation. This is, this is stuff I am, as you can tell, still trying to figure out. So it, I'm glad it's, be, it's been taped because I wasn't taking notes, but I will listen to this again. 
For that, we I said stuff I didn't realize I was going to say. <laughs> and you realize there's a bunch of people tweeting stuff that you are friending you on Facebook now, and we have to tell them it ain't you. OK, um, there actually is a Facebook account that mirrors my blog, and there's a Twitter account that mirrors my blog. I control a Facebook account, but not the Twitter account. Someone else set that up. But I never actually visit these sites. All right, then. <laughs> so, so don't, 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 don't send me stuff on Facebook. So please join me in thanking Bruce Schneier for a very provocative 90 minutes.